Hi guys, so I'm here to do my reading wrap up for the month of September. Some of you may have noticed, many of you probably didn't, that I didn't film a wrap up in the middle of the month. Because even though I have been reading a lot a lot this month, it's been for work, um, so I haven't been able to talk about it on YouTube and therefore I have just saved up everything for a end of month wrap up this month. I'm sure I'll be back to mid month wrap ups in October. I like could not remember what month came after September there. So I have six things to talk to you about in this video and without further ado, let's jump straight into them. So I listened to the audiobook of Lowborn by Kerry Hudson, the subtitle of which is Growing Up, Getting Away and Returning to Britain's Poorest Towns. So this book is narrated by the author, which I really enjoyed because it is her experience. It's, you know, semi-autobiographical. I mean, it is a, actually, it is very much a biography, but like through her autobiography, exploring what poverty is like in uh, Scotland and uh, more generally in the UK. And Kerry Hudson grew up in quite an impoverished part of Aberdeen, uh, partly. She jumped around a lot, um, going from England to Scotland to different parts of both countries throughout her childhood. Um, because of poverty and instability and because of that she actually has a really unique accent but it's so soothing. She just narrates this book beautifully and like I said because it's her experience I like hearing it from her. Her intonations, her emotions coming through in her voice and I really really enjoyed that and I think this is a book that whether you read in physical form or uh, listen to an audiobook I would recommend everyone give a shot. It is such an important book because Kerry's experience is the experience of a lot of children uh, who are now adults and a lot of children that are still children. This is not like a thing of the past. In fact, poverty, if anything, has really just increased in the UK uh, with austerity measures that have been implemented by the government. Um, just. I mean, <laughs> we could get on a whole diatribe here about why there's poverty in the UK in the 21st century in a wealthy country. But what Kerry's book does is show you what it is genuinely like for children, what her personal experience was, an experience that she wasn't alone in, um, but that she was probably one of a small amount to kind of escape because the cycle of poverty is a very real thing and it's very difficult to get out of through no fault of uh, the people who are living in poverty. Whereas Kerry Hudson went on to be quite a successful writer, she very much distanced herself from her childhood and her family and her past and when she went to write this book she had to confront all of that and through that experienced a new sort of emotional turmoil and really yeah had to come face to face with what happened to her and some of the things that she blocked out, some of the things that she hadn't fully remembered or comprehended because she was a child. Um, and. Yeah, it's a really hard one to explain. It's a very hard hitting, a very emotional book, but a very important book. And I think Kerry Hudson did something incredible by sitting down to write this book, by going out there to research this book um, and, and sharing it with the world. I think it's an incredible thing for her to have done. I don't know if I'm doing the best job of summarising this book, but I hope what does come across from uh, my discussion of it is that you should read it, I think. We should all, you know, sort of um, make the most of what Kerry Hudson has given us by really delving deep into her childhood and her past. And it's a really important story. So yes, would recommend five out of five stars. Now I will move on to another book. The next book I want to mention is Saga Volume 7, which is a trade paperback in a comic book series, binding together a few different issues. and. It has been a long time since I read volume 6. I certainly was reading Saga at a much quicker rate when it first came out. It was one that had a lot of um, good publicity from first issue. A lot of people were reading on booktube. I picked up, I was reading along as it came out. And then just sort of faded off and I find I do this with long comic book series. I think they're just too long for me. I like a kind of neat story arc, um, maybe like four or five volumes because I do just start to tail off a bit when they go on for so long and that's not a criticism of the story or the books, that's just a personal preference as the kind of reader I am and I'm obviously just not as much of like a long term 
comic book reader who can commit to something like that. So what happens is I might then pick up a later volume quite some time after reading the last one and you're just not as into it I find. So it's been over a year since I read volume 6. I enjoyed volume 7 and catching back up on what was going on in these characters' stories, but I wasn't eagerly anticipating what was coming next because I just sort of moved on in my head. And equally, I'm not sure I'm about to desperately pick up volume set 8. I mean, I say that, you might next month see me reading volume 8 because my library has it or something and I did borrow uh, volume 7 from my library. But I'm not going to buy it, if that makes sense, you know? Like, I'm going to borrow them, I'm not going to buy them, like, I'm not a hardcore fan. I'm just waiting for them to fall into my path and then I will continue reading them because I do enjoy them and I do enjoy the storyline, but it doesn't make a massive difference in my life if I don't keep reading them. <laughs> if you know what I mean. This is a space opera series I'm sure you've all heard about at this point which follows two different uh, alien races who are at war with each other. Uh, one with horns, one with wings and we have a woman and a man from either race who have fallen in love. Romeo and Juliet style, they're forbidden from being together, they've abandoned their respective armies, um, they've gotten pregnant and they're, they're sort of fleeing the authorities who don't want them to be together because it would suggest that then their people can get on. Which would be bad for all the people that are invested in the war. So they give birth to a child in the very first issue and the child is actually the narrator of these stories and so she is now older in, in the narrative and is recalling her childhood and growing up and we're following that storyline and she's maybe like five or six or seven now in, in volume seven she's a little bit older and it, it feels like the focus of the comic books are changing so that she's more central. She's not only the narrator but because she is more compass mentis, you know, she is uh, developing her personality and thoughts and feelings and at some points gets separated from her parents, we're more following her than I necessarily feel we're following the two characters who we were initially focused on, the, the mother and father. But it's multiple perspectives, there's other aliens that we follow that have different reasons for being involved in this story line and much drama ensues that includes a lot a lot of graphic violence and sex so this is a very much an adult comic book series you know it's not really appropriate for children uh, just be warned on that front and I totally I I remembered that it was really graphic because that is one of the things that really you know stands out about it but I think because I hadn't actually experienced the comic books for such a long time it really did take me by surprise because I just don't think I've been reading things that are as graphic recently. Not that I have a complaint about graphic content, like I think if it's used to good effect, like have at it. I was just like, oh dear, I've, I've become quite British over the past few months, I haven't read anything like this in a while. Um, but it didn't bother me, I just remember being very much, you know, like, oh, yeah, that, forgot. <laughs> so if you haven't read Saga, there you go. Again, I feel like I'm not my most articulate today, but it's hard to talk about a comic book series when you're so far into it to people who may not have started it. But that's the general gist of things. I'm just kind of, like, in the middle. I'm just kind of sitting on the fence with the whole series at this point. I then read a book that I'm less fence sitting about and that is Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazo Kawaguchi and this is a translated Japanese novel and I really enjoy Japanese literature, what I have read of it, which is a very limited amount. But the translated Japanese literature I've read I've really enjoyed and this um, kind of category of translated fiction I've been exploring more and more over the past couple of years. This one was actually a massive bestseller when it came out in Japan a few years ago and it's it's been translated quite speedily for um, a, a non-English book into English and I think it's going to be reasonably successful here too because it, it was really good and it managed to encompass a really broad range of human emotions. It's quite a quirky little book and it's set in this cafe which allows its customers to time travel. So those that visit the cafe, if they sit in one specific seat, they get poured a cup of coffee, they think very hard about the time they want to travel back to, they can then go there and as long as they finish their cup of coffee before it gets cold, they will, you know, return to their own time unharmed. However, 
you can only visit the cafe in the past, so if you want to speak to somebody, they have to have visited the cafe. Um, so you can't like go back in time to a time before the cafe existed or to another country. You can only travel back in time within the cafe. So you can only speak to people that have visited the cafe. I think I've already said that, but yeah, you understand. Those are the rules of the time travel in this book. And you cannot change the present. That's another one of the rules. Like no matter what you do when you travel back in time, if you say something different, it's not going to change the circumstances in which you are currently living. And because of that, most people are like, why would you even bother? This seems a little bit pointless. But we follow a selection of different characters, staff and customers, who decide to take advantage of this time travel and uh, sort of relive moments of their past for whatever reason, perhaps because they didn't feel like they got to have their say during a breakup or they never gave someone the chance to tell them something that they now wish they had learned or that person has perhaps passed away and they just want to speak to them one last time and through these different experiences uh, we, we just sort of get to see time travel I think in the same way that a lot of us want to time travel every day we wish we'd said something we didn't say we wish we'd listen to someone we didn't listen to them we wish we could just have one last conversation with someone we'd lost and it's very human and it's very identifiable and even though they can't change the present it can change their perspective on the present and perhaps change their actions in the future um, by reflecting back on the past and I think what I came away from this book thinking was that yeah I can't go to a magical cafe that will allow me to time travel but I can reflect on the past and change myself even if I can't change the present and I think it's actually quite a realistic book despite the time travel aspect and it's quaint and slow and all about humans and people rather than being super plot focused and I really enjoyed it. But the next three books I read were all Tessa Dare romance books. If you remember my reading wrap up from the end of August you'll remember that I was binging Tessa Dare books by the end of the month. Tessa Dare writes historical 1800s romances that I like to think of as Jane Austen books but without the kind of qualms of the 1800s allow women to be a little bit more fierce and feisty and embrace their sexualities. So that's my kind of pitch for a Tessa Dare book and I really really enjoy them. They combine you know all of the loving romance feels with excellent humour and wonderful female protagonists. Always always enjoy a Tessa Dare book and I read three more of them that were continuing on from my August binge. So I read all of these right at the beginning of September when I was still feeling a bit run down and just needed um, the like sort of cheerful fun of a Tessa Dare book. So I read book three and four in the Spindle Cove series which I think is my favourite series of hers that I've read so far. It's set in a small seaside town where basically women who don't quite fit into um, English society go. So they might be wallflowers or they might be a little bit too mouthy or just not quite the ladies of society that they're expected to be. So one other aristocratic woman has sort of set up this escape for them where they can be themselves. They can be geologists if they want to be geologists. They can be poets if they want to be poets and it's a lovely place for them to, uh, you know, really discover themselves and, as happens in each of the novels, discover a romance and fall in love and they're really cute and really funny. So those books were A Lady by Midnight and Any Duchess Will Do. You can read these books independently because they each follow a new central female character and I've read them slightly out of order um, but I'm now kind of reading them in order. However, because they have the same setting, the characters do um, reappear and crop back up and are side characters in the novels that are not main characters in. A Lady by Midnight follows a woman who has been living in Spindle Cove for some time. She's a music teacher, she has an unknown background, she was an orphan and she starts to learn a little bit about her past and who her family really were in this storyline as well as how she may have in fact met one of the um, militia army men currently living in the town when she was much much younger and they fall in love, naturally. I then also read uh, Any Duchess Will Do, which is book four, and it's a sort of Pygmalion, My Fair Lady retelling, where a woman of the lower classes from Spindle Cove, who is, you know, like a working woman, grown up on a farm, now works as a barmaid, ends up whisked off her feet and taken to London to be trained up to be the wife of um, a duke. 
and it's possibly my favourite of the series so far. It's so much fun. I love the banter between the two main characters. I love how they're constantly like, like locking horns and uh, pushing each other to come out of their shell and also just sort of like seeing the best in each other and I I love that one I thought it was so 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 funny any duchess will do and then I decided to read book one in the castles ever after series which is another series by Tessa Dare and this one had more of like a gothic almost fantastical feel to it so it's not a fancy book at all there's no magic but it's set in like a crumbling rural mansion manor house that our um, protagonist inherits from her godfather however when she gets there there is still a duke living there he doesn't realize that his castle has been sold because he lost his eyesight and it seems as though his uh, like lawyers have been taking advantage of his new reclusive state since his injury and been selling off his property. So they have to kind of uncover what's happened and they join and they join forces to kind of solve the mystery. She obviously wants the castle that she's inherited, he wants to know what's been going on and naturally they fall in love but it has a much more like gothic feel to it. This castle, I should have said, it's not a mansion, it's a castle, is constantly making creepy noises, there's bats, it's falling apart and in particular our protagonist is actually the daughter of a man who wrote a serialised children's fairy tale for magazines and there's these mega fans who love these stories that then come and visit her, it's its really, really fun and wacky. And it just felt quite different from the other Tessa Dare books I've read and it would be a great, great place to start, I think, because it is book one in a series and I will obviously be continuing on with this series when I get a chance, although I'm not quite on my romance binge as I was at the end of August, beginning of September, as I think you can tell I have read some slightly different things since then. <laughs> um, but that is everything I have read in September that I can tell you about. Super cash wrap up style again. I know a few of you said you enjoyed my last wrap up where it was very casual, so I kind of stuck with that and I'm sitting in my mum's spare room right now. Bit dishevelled, bit inarticulate, but there we have it. If you want to discuss these books further, please do leave a comment down below and I'd love to know if you have any recommendations based on the books I've mentioned in this video. But until next time, happy reading and I'll see you again soon. Bye guys.